Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen Wa sallallahu salam mubarak ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina wa imamina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in amma ba'd Hadith 101 for the Institute Alhamdulillah I was given the honor And I was blessed and fortunate enough To be chosen and selected to spearhead the project on these beginners classes, uh, Hadith 101 for Ilm Institute with uh, our brother in Al-Islam, our friend and colleague, Brother Sajid Lipham. May Allah bless him and bless him in all of his efforts and accept him well. The selected resource or piece of material that we're going to use for the course is a small book that I put together and I wrote uh, a few years back one night in the Prophet's Masjid. I put together the book, I start writing the book, uh, I believe it was between Maghrib and Isha one night, and Alhamdulillah, I had a few brothers and a few sisters look over the book, edit the book, and put it together. But unfortunately, for one reason or another, the book has never yet reached uh, the ink press. The name of the book or the work is going to be called The Disciples Primer. The Disciples Primer. The Primer for the Disciple. And it says on the cover, a pocketbook introduction to the science of hadith. A pocketbook introduction to the science of hadith. So this is the material that we're going to be using for the class or for this course, Bidin Allah Ta'ala. And hopefully by Allah's permission it will be made available uh, for the students uh, and the learners in the, in the institute. The book, as I said before, is considered to be a, or I'm saying now, and it's a revolutionary work. Um, I think it's the first of its like. Uh, it's a, a small pocketbook, nothing extensive, nothing exhaustive, nothing uh, complicated or too much to tackle. That's written in the form of question and answer. And it's written by someone whose native tongue is English for someone who's learning and studying the science of hadith in his or her native tongue of English. In a simplified, easy question and answer form. In Al-Islam, we all know the wisdom of posing a question and then answering the question. Or we all know the wisdom of questions being asked and being put forth and the answers being given to the people. The Quran on Kareem is full of this. So many ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about, they ask you. They ask you, O Muhammad. They ask you concerning this. They ask you concerning that. Qul, tell them. Qul here. Qul huwa. Qul inna. Tell them this, tell them that, tell them so on and so forth. Okay? So Allah, he tells us that they ask the Prophet. And from them asking that question, the benefit is sent down in the response. As far as the sunnah of the Prophet, then that's even, or we have the same amount, if not more, clarity. From that is the hadith of Jibreel, alayhi salatu salam. When she asked a question, and the Prophet ﷺ gave him the answer. And then when Jibreel left, the Messenger of Allah said to me, asked him, do you know who this was? The companion says, we don't know who it is. He says, this is Jibreel. Atakum yu'allimukum dinakum. He has come to you to teach you your deen. So the hadith tells us that Jibreel came as a teacher, but in actuality he came nothing more than a questioner. He didn't teach anything. The only thing that Jibreel alayhi salam said was, Akhbirni, tell me. And he said, Sadaqt, you have spoken the truth. In our modern standards, that wouldn't necessarily be considered teaching. He didn't teach anything. But the sheer fact of him asking the question, the Prophet ﷺ called him a teacher. Let alone the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ himself poses the question and he himself answers the question. Such as the hadith that says, Atadruna man in muflis. Do you know who the bankrupt person is? Atadruna malghiba. Do you know what backbiting is? And the list goes on of the authentic narrations in which the Prophet asks a question and he answers the question. So posing a question, asking a question, and then oftentimes answering it yourself or having someone else answer it is a major way of learning, a major style of learning. The Prophet said to me, asked Ma'ad ibn Jabal, do you know what Allah's right upon his servants is? And Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, Labbeka wa sa'adika ya Rasulullah. Here I am at your service, O Messenger of Allah. I'm your loyal servant. I'm here at your, at your side, whatever you need. 
And he asked him again in a second and a third time. And the Prophet ﷺ, he told him what the right of Allah Azza wa upon his servants is. And what the right of the servants of Allah, or the rights of the servants of Allah upon Allah, what they are if they perform the first right. And the list goes on, we go on and on and on, hadith after hadith, ayah after ayah, pertaining to asking questions, the virtue of asking questions, and those questions being answered. So all of these different things uh, have been explained to me by my teachers in the Prophet ﷺ city, whether it be in the College of Hadith, or whether it be in the Prophet's Masjid or other places. And this is the reason why I wanted to write the book like this, in Q&A style. Easy, simple, basic, but yet uh, interesting and wholesome. Khairan insha'Allah ta'ala. As far as the etiquettes of the student of hadith, and what are the things that you should be doing for this course, and when you're learning and studying this course, whether you're a new Muslim, whether you've been Muslim your entire life, but you never studied hadith science, whatever the reason behind you taking this course and uh, taking these classes, first and foremost is to purify your intention. It is al-ikhlas, is to be sincere. وَمَا umiru. Allah says, and they were only commanded, إِلَّا لِعَبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ دِينَ حُنَفَاءَ وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُ الزَّكَاةَ وَذَلِكَ دِينُ قَيْمَةَ Allah says, and the only thing that they were requested to do is to worship Allah. مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ Alone, without any partner, sincerely and devoutly, and an established prayer, and to give the zakah, for that is the straight religion, and the way of the straight religion. The Prophet ﷺ, he tells us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَنَا أَغْنَى الشُّرَكَيَ عَنِ الشِّرْكِ مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَدًا أَشْرَكَ فِيهِ مَعِيَ غَيْرِي تَرَقْتُهُ وَشِرْكَهُ Allah says, I have no need for partners. I'm free from partners. I'm most self-sufficient. There are no second or third. There's no rival with me. Anyone who performs an act and when she makes shirk therein with me, I will abandon him and I will abandon his shirk. So we have to purify ourselves we have to be mindful of why we're seeking knowledge, why we're studying, why we're listening to these classes, why we're teaching these classes. And obviously every Muslim knows this, but it's something that we always need to remind ourselves thereof. Another very important etiquette is for us to uh, come to this class or these courses as students with an empty cup, with no pre-assumptions, no thoughts, no previous information that you know or you think you know or you've heard or you've been taught, but come with an clean slate, a clean slate, an empty cup in order to receive the knowledge and receive the teaching and take what you feel is useful and beneficial and disregard that which you feel isn't useful and isn't beneficial. And in many other etiquettes as well with regards to the knowledge seeker in general and with regards to the student of hadith specifically. Khairan insha'Allah ta'ala. On page 5, we have a quote, it says here, from the most important sciences is the science of verifying the prophetic hadiths, knowing their contexts, distinguishing those which are authentic and fair from those which are weak and poor, along with the rest of its well-known sections and divisions. Imam Noe 676AH. A very beautiful quote and a very important quote. And it goes to show us the virtue of the science of hadith and how the Muslim is to learn the science of hadith. And that is because it is from the most important sciences, meaning of the deen, al-ulum al shariya Chemistry, biology, botany, and those other things are important as well, and necessities of life as well. But it's not necessarily what we're talking about when we speak on ilm and science. But we're talking about the knowledge and the science of the heart. The knowledge and the science of the soul and of the spirit, and that's the knowledge and the science of the deen of al-Islam. So we have science of Qur'an, we have science of the Arabic language, we have the science of history, the science of sirah, the science of fiqh, the science of legal maxims and principles, and we have the science of hadith. Anoe, who is well known, well respected, he says, from the most important, not necessarily the most important, but from the top, the best of the best, the highest of the high, is the science of verification, of determining what is authentic and what isn't authentic, how and why. How and why? What does this hadith say? What does it mean? Is it authentic? Is it genuine or not? I.e., should I pray like this or pray like this or pray like this? Do my hands belong here, here, here? What do I do with my salah? How do I pay zakat? How do I fast? How do I make hajj? What colors can I wear as a woman wearing hijab? Do I have to cover my hands and my face or not? And the list goes on. What foods are lawful? What drinks are lawful? With regards to the rulings that the servant is required to adhere to. 
Allah says, I've only created the jinn and the, the humans to worship me. That's why we're breathing, that's why we're living, that's why we're talking and walking. But how do we know what to do? How to worship Allah, how to serve Allah? What is lawful, what isn't lawful, what's right, what's wrong? Unless we have a precedent. And that precedent is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. But as we have established, any great man in history, any great man in history, Muslim, non-Muslim, prophet, messenger, leader, political leader, spiritual guide, there are going to be people who make mistakes regarding what he said and what he did. And there are going to be people who lie intentionally. And there are going to be people who pass on and spread inaccuracies. If we looked at the world today, and we look at one of the major religions of the world, or one of the major spiritual movements of the world, is Buddhism. Buddhism. But how many people misquote Buddha? And misinterpret the things that he actually said. Let alone lie on Buddha. Those who worship Buddha, who was never a mean, or not, he was never a means of worship. Buddha, not according to Muslims, Jews, Christians, historians, to the true Buddhists themselves, they'll tell you that Buddha was never meant to be worshipped. He was meant to be emulated, a spiritual guide. And there are other Buddhas that were actually considered to be divine, that were worshipped, the countless gods. shirk. But the point we're trying to prove is, is not only are the words of Buddha uh, inaccurately passed down, oftentimes misinterpret, misinterpreted, uh, misrepresented it, but the core of his message was misinterpreted. He wasn't even supposed to be a god. He wasn't even supposed to be divine. And people worship him today. And they say a Buddhist worships Buddha, which is not necessarily correct. So any man or woman that was great, a major historical figure, who lived 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it's a long time ago, 300 years ago, George Washington, one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, Ben Franklin, Hamilton, these people like this, people misinterpret them, they misquote them, they lie on them for one reason or another, and they only died a couple hundred years ago, let alone someone who died 500 years ago, let alone someone who died 1,000 years ago, let alone someone who died 1,400 years ago. So it's going to happen. And this is the importance and the virtue of the science of Hadith, is that it allows you to sift, it allows you to decipher, it allows you to look into that which has been passed down about this great man named Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the pick was authentic, he actually said and that which is inauthentic. He never ever said this. And among that which he did, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, it is to be understood properly. It is to be represented properly. And it isn't to be misinterpreted and misunderstood and misrepresented. That is what Anowi is saying here. He says, from the most important sciences is the science of verifying the prophetic hadiths. What the Prophet said. What the Prophet did. What the Prophet allowed. How the Prophet looked. How the Prophet behaved, what was his character? Is the hadith that says, Abu Halali in Allah Talaq, the most hated thing that Allah has made lawful is divorce. Is that authentic? Did the Prophet say that? Is that true? And if he did say that, what did he mean by that? How can you determine as a Muslim, as a layman Muslim, you're going through problems, you want to get divorced, you want to get a, a separation, or you don't want to get divorced, you don't want to, how do you know what to do and what not to do? Unless you have some type of scale, unless you have some type of gauge, unless you have some type of criterion, and that is what a noe is saying. A noe, Rahim al Ta'ala, he says, knowing their contexts, the hadith that says, that the woman who's burying the baby alive and the baby who's being buried alive are both in the fire of hell. What does that hadith mean? Is it authentic? That's step number one. If it is authentic, what is meant by that hadith? Because it's clearly problematic. How can the baby who's being buried alive in the desert go to the fire of hell? And it didn't make any sin. It never made any type of act of vice. How can it be in the fire like the mother? The mother clearly going to the fire of hell. A pagan, idol worshiper, burying the child alive. But what about the innocent baby? How do we know the context of this hadith? The hadith that tells us, Men bedda da dinahu faqturuhu. He who changes his religion, kill him. What does this mean? If a person doesn't want to be a Muslim anymore, you execute them, you slaughter them. What does that mean? What is the context of that hadith? 
And the list goes on example after example to show the importance of sciences of hadith. Anawi, he says, distinguishing by yourself, learning and having the tools, those which are authentic and fair, sahih and hasan, from those which are weak and poor, da'if, da'if jiddin, mawdu, etc. The sciences of hadith. But that's not it. He says, along with the rest of its well-known sections and divisions, the narrators, the sahaba, the tabi'un, the mukhadramun, right? What is Sahih Bukhari and what is Sunan Abu Dawud? I'm reading in a book about marriage, a book about purification of the soul, and it says in the footnotes, Al Hakim. It says in the footnotes, Ad Dadimi. It says in the footnotes, Ad Dailimi. It says in the footnotes with an authentic chain. What does that mean? Where is it coming from? Well, who is Hakim and what's Mustadrak? Who is Ahmed and what's a Musnad? All right? The different levels of hadiths, the types of hadiths, etc. The rest of its well-known sciences is from the most important of the affairs and the sciences. So this is extreme food for thought. Extreme food for thought. Moving on to the next page. On page 6, there is a testimonial. It says here, I started my journey of seeking knowledge four years ago. But it wasn't until I was introduced to the science of hadith that I felt like all the pieces of the puzzle were coming together for me. This booklet is a great summary of information. It took me a while to gather and grasp. It is also a great review for those familiar with the, fee, with the field. Initials M. Bent Ahmed. So this is a testimonial from not a brother or a man, but a sister in Islam, a woman, a disciple of Hadith. She read the book. She benefited from the book. And she's telling you what the book did for her. Moving forward, then we have on page number one, the author's introduction. The author's introduction. And as we have explained many times before, from that which we have been taught by our teachers and our professors, the importance, rather the necessity of reading the introduction to the book. Now behind you, you may see many books. What the camera doesn't see are many, many, many other books. What is not seen or seen in this location, whether it's my home, my mother's house, this place, this storage room, are loads and hordes of even more books. So if someone came into my house, or came into my masjid, or my library, or this or that, and says, have you read all of these books? You're so smart. You're so studious. You have all of these books. Have you read all of them? Can I honestly say that I've read every single volume, and one book has 500 pages, 1,000 pages, 300 pages, 200 pages? Can I say that? What is my answer to my guest as we sit over green tea and biscuits and he says have you read these books i had a teacher in the islamic university of medina one of the most senior teachers in the college he would always tell us to read the introductions to the book and he would say the same thing that i just said to you if a guest comes over my house and he says have you read these books the teacher the sheikh he says naam qad qara'tuha. i've read them so obviously the guest is saying how is this possible there's just too many books in this room for you to have read i don't believe that you're exaggerating the Sheikh, he said, that if I read the introduction to the book, and if I've read the, the table of contents and look through the index, he says, then as if I read those books. Meaning, I know for sure what is in this book. Every single letter, comma, colon, every hyphen, every paragraph, I don't claim that. But I know who the author is, who the author is when it was written, how it was written, etc. And I know what's in the book when I need it. So with that being said, it is as if I've actually read the book. So he's trying to explain to us, and this was in my last, my last year of the College of Hadith, the importance of reading the introduction of the book, let alone knowing the style of the author and knowing what to look out for and what to stay away from and what to look for, etc. And there are many types of confusion, mistake, error, inaccuracy, even misguidance that may come from a person not reading the introduction to the book. So this is extremely important. For every single student of knowledge, beginner, intermediate, master, is to always at least read the introduction and always at least skim through or peruse through the table of contents and the index slash bibliography and also look and skim through the book and then you can actually say that I've read the book because I know what's in the book. Tayyip, the author, he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim In the name of Allah, the gracious, the beneficent. May Allah be praised. I send prayers and salutations upon Muhammad, his companions and followers, to proceed. The purpose of this booklet is to enlighten the everyday Muslim or Muslimah on the basics of the great and noble science of Hadith. 
It is meant to introduce you to the simple concept of a hadith and its components. Some of its main books and greatest authors. That's the purpose of the book. And that is the purpose of the course. Not to make you a master. Not to give you everything. Not to confuse you and razzle and dazzle. No. But to introduce you to get your feet wet. To walk off of the beach and the bank into the water. And then be the Italy, take another step, and a second, and a third, and a fourth. And you gradually learn how to swim, and gradually learn how to dive. And there's endless, or there's, there's endless options when you can swim as a master swimmer, as a fish or a dolphin. But you have to learn how to step into the water step by step. The author, may Allah forgive him, he says... I believe that this uh, that this small but large I says I believe that these small but large pieces of information should be known by every single Muslim, man, woman, child, no matter what their background and level of Islamic knowledge and awareness may be. It is isn't specific to, specific to students of knowledge. It isn't specific to imams or leaders of communities. It isn't specific to men. Women shouldn't read this the, uh, this book or this information. Women should just get married, have children, suckle their children, and then that's it. No. La. A woman, a female can be a student of knowledge, just like a male can be a student of knowledge. Certain things that a woman cannot do, that a man can do, yes. Such as being an imam in the religion. Okay? Certain uh, ways in which she speaks and addresses people. She can't do everything that a man can do. Just like a man cannot do everything that a woman can do. So everyone should have basic knowledge of what a hadith is. What is Sahih al-Bukhari? Who is Imam al-Bukhari? What is Sahih? What does that mean? All right. What is the responsibility of the Muslim with regards to hearing the hadith and acting upon the hadith? Every Muslim should know this. The author, may Allah forgive him, he says, This book is a total of 26, que 26 questions and answers I wrote the other day between the Asr and Maghrib at the Prophet's sacred mosque. As I clearly said, if my memory serves me correctly, it was either between the Asr and Maghrib or Maghrib and Isha, or maybe even maybe even both. Perhaps I started after Asr, and I didn't get finished until the Adhan and the Iqama for Salat and Isha. What I know for sure, and what I, I remember for sure, because I wrote this many years ago, as you'll see, and the date that we'll mention to you, is that I was in the Prophet's Masjid, and it was definitely between uh, a prayer, if not two prayers. It says here, As a simplified beginner's guide to Hadith, it is meant to lead, not explain. Please listen carefully, and most importantly, to empty out your vessel. Take your cup and empty it. Turn it upside down. It says, as a simplified beginner's guide, meaning that someone who isn't a beginner is a different story. Learning, investigating, asking, it's a different story. But as a beginner, my first course in Hadith, my first proper class, my first structured course in the science, I'm a beginner. What is your responsibility? The author, he says, a beginner's guide to hadith is meant to lead and not to explain. Everything is not to be explained. You don't have to understand everything. And this is one of the greatest tricks of the shaitan and of Iblis with regards to hindering people from knowledge. They say, I can't sit in these classes. They're too hard. I can't sit in these classes. They're too difficult. Or, you know, I don't understand everything. Or, you know, he talks too fast. Or this and of that. Who said that you deserve everything from the class? Why are you so selfish and self-centered? Who said that you have to get 100% of every single thing that's been said to you in an hour or 45 minutes? Wallahi, if you sat in a class and you benefited 50%, half of what was said, it's not a loss. If you benefited 70%, that's a great high percentage. People who do things, do they do it right every single time? Is that the way of life? Is a person absolutely perfect and never ever make a mistake? No. But they're not judged by being perfect or, la or lack of perfection. They're judged by percentage of accuracy. Accuracy, 8 out of 10, 7 out of 10, 9 out of 10 is highly accurate. So if you sat in a class and there are only a few things that you didn't get, a few things that you didn't understand, a few things that you couldn't really truly grasp, it's not a loss. And there's no reason for you to quit and for you to leave that class. Rather, if you came to the masjid or you sat in front of your uh, tablet or smartphone or computer screen and you listened to a course or you benefited from a lecture, one thing, 10%, five minutes and that's it from an hour, it still wouldn't be a loss. It still wouldn't be a loss. So we have to be mindful of emptying our cups. We have to be mindful of being humble and not being so stuck up and self-centered and demanding uh, 
everything. Self-gratification, instant gratification. That's not the way of the true learner of hadith. So it's meant to lead and not necessarily to explain. The intended wish is that this humble work will spark the reader's interest and drive him or her to larger and more explanatory works. That is the purpose of studying a small book of metin, is not to explain everything. And the explanation of that metin should not be something which is of volumes. That's wrong. Short, simple, sweet, right to the point, and it's meant to get you to want more, get you to read more. That was very interesting. But I have many other questions left now. That was enlightening, but I'm still, I still need more. I still want more. There are things that I hear or read in a book or I see people doing and talking about that wasn't in the beginner's book. Go to the next step. Move on to the next level. That's the purpose of the work. We ask Allah the Sublime and Most High to make it a means of reviving the study of the Sunnah. A means of pleasure for the true Hadith lovers and a thorn in the side of every jealous and envious hater. Amin. Mufti Muhammad ibn Munir al Madina al Munawwara from the Prophet's Sacred Mosque, April 18th, 2014. And obviously, uh, we're in 2018. So the book was officially written four whole years ago. Tayyip.